Hello folks, Rod Machado here. Here's a little video on the history of our national airspace system. Everything in aviation has an origin. For instance, the first approach lighting system probably consisted of two big bonfires, each located on opposite ends of a runway. Pilots would overfly the first fire and try to stop before reaching the second. Those who didn't stop as planned ran into the fire. Thus the origin of the phrase, he landed hot. Our modern airspace system also has an origin. And over the decades, there have been many answers to the questions, how high in the sky can I fly? And can I come a little near my cloud to thee? The whole thing probably began with a loud bang as two airplanes tried to share the same cloud at the same time. The invention of the shrimp boat method of aircraft separation, in other words, small paper strips placed on a board painted with airways, which helped controllers mimic the control of air traffic, more or less put a stop to these cloud sharing shenanigans. Now, a pilot could no longer exercise his shellfish desire to hog the entire cloud himself. He had to share it with another pilot under the supervision of a ground controller. The time when pilots could fly IFR whenever they wanted, wherever they wanted, and within eyebrow-raising distances of each other is now long gone, as are the pilots who did such things. On the other hand, Tower and Route Control, or TEC, today allows pilots to fly IFR whenever they want, GPS allows them to fly wherever they want, and the new Reduced Vertical Separation Minimums, RSVM, above 29,000 feet, allow pilots to fly within eyebrow-raising distances of one another again. So, we've made a lot of progress, I think. There have been some interesting developments in the airspace regulations along the way. This is particularly evident in the rules to keep VFR pilots from bumping into IFR airplanes that popped out the side or the top of a cloud. Here is where form follows function and rules follow speed. In a 1938 Bureau of Air Commerce rule book, pilots making something known as contact flight, which is something resembling today's VFR flight, were required to remain 300 feet above or below any cloud formation unless it was precipitating. Precipitation required that a pilot maintain a vertical distance of 500 feet from any cloud formation. A horizontal distance of 2,000 feet from any cloud formation was also required by this regulation. Now, by 1945, the visibility and proximity to cloud rules had been amended to remove the precipitation clause, thus requiring a consistent 500-foot vertical separation from a cloud. In the mid-1950s, the civil air regulations were modified once again to require pilots to maintain a separation of 500 feet below, 2,000 feet horizontally, and 1,000 feet vertically from any cloud formation. Now, why the higher distance above a cloud than below? The reason is that airplanes typically climb a lot faster than their pilots allow them to descend. And this is especially true of the post-war era, where aviation saw the development of high-performance jet airplanes. Think about it this way. The closer pilots get to the ground, the more concerned they become about excessive descent rates. And it's much more difficult to arrest the sink of an airplane, especially larger, more massive ones, when they descend faster. As a student pilot, I did some groundbreaking work in landing, so I speak from experience. On the other hand, there's almost always a good reason to climb as fast as the airplane's performance permits. Below 10,000 feet MSL, it's rare to see airplanes, particularly the larger ones, descending in excess of several thousand feet per minute. It's not, however, unusual to see small business jet aircraft at lower altitudes climbing at and beyond these rates. So now you know why you need more distance above a cloud than below. At least the increased vertical separation offers you a greater chance of seeing and being seen by another airplane. But what about your horizontal distance from a cloud formation? Prior to 1961, a pilot could fly VFR at any altitude. 
and that's with the exception of a few point-to-point, 40-mile-wide positive control route segments existing from 17,000 to 35,000 feet MSL. There was no such thing as a positive control area, and that's what we now call Class A airspace, at the time. The 2,000-foot horizontal distance from any cloud applied to whatever altitude a pilot wanted to fly. Given that, there were no airspeed limits for any altitude at that time. It's quite possible that some pilot was maneuvering at 2,000 feet horizontally from a cloud only to look over and see a fast machine exiting the puff. And this, of course, allowed him just enough time to mouth the words, what the, before the lights went out, creating dangling participles. Apparently, the aerial authorities wanted pilots to complete their sentences, so in 1957, things changed a bit. A larger cloud clearance requirement was established to compensate for the increased chance of finding faster airplanes at higher altitudes. In 1957, aviation witnessed the creation of something known as the Continental Control Area which consisted of all airspace over the continental United States at and above 24,000 feet MSL. Pilots flying in this area were required to have 5 miles visibility, up from the maximum of 3 miles previously, and now needed 1,000 feet of vertical separation and 1 mile of horizontal separation from clouds. There were still no airspeed limits posted for airplanes at that time, so it was still quite possible for a blue-tinted, slightly frozen general aviation pilot to be flying above 24,000 feet while maneuvering one mile from a cloud only to look over and see a fast machine exiting the side of the cloud. At least the pilot now had enough time to complete his sentence and say, what is that before the lights went out. And this left dangling pilots, but no longer dangling participles. So I guess we might say that's progress. Now, I always tell my students that regulatory cloud distances are the numbers lawyers use to argue for or against your guilt in court. Practically speaking, it's much better to ask yourself how far away from a cloud you'd like to be to have at least a fighting chance of seeing and avoiding the fastest airplane that could inhabit that airspace, as well as being able to construct larger sentences. In 1960, the Continental Control Area was lowered to 14,500 feet for two reasons. First, it lowered the base of controlled airspace and established a top for the areas consisting of uncontrolled airspace. This meant that pilots who couldn't maintain the basic VFR requirement in the Continental Control Area were required to file an instrument flight plan. Second, the folks in charge of the airspace realized that the concept of one mile horizontal distance from clouds and five miles visibility was such a good idea that they thought it should apply to much lower altitudes, specifically 14,500 feet and above. And just as an aside, the decision to establish the continental control area at 14,500 feet was originally based on the highest mountain in the United States, which is Mount Whitney, whose peak presently stands at 14,491 feet. And it would probably stop shrinking if souvenir hunters would stop chipping away at its top. And this made the continental control area a peak experience, so to speak. By the mid-1960s, interesting things were happening, not only because a British rock group named itself after an insect, but because someone decided that the five-mile visibility, one-mile horizontal, and 1,000-foot vertical cloud separation requirement was such an incredible idea that it should be applied to all areas at and above 10,000 feet MSL. Below 10,000 feet, Pilots could fly with a cloud clearance requirement of 1,000 feet above, 2,000 feet horizontally, and 500 feet below, and 3 miles visibility in controlled airspace. In one sense, this makes sense, since the FAA established a maximum indicated airspeed limit of 250 knots below 10,000 feet. On the other hand, at a distance of 2,000 feet from the side of a cloud, a machine popping out of the puff 
at close to 300 knots true airspeed. Yes, this is the approximate true airspeed for an indicated airspeed of 250 knots around 10,000 feet MSL. This gives you just enough time to say what before the lights go out again. So don't be too stingy with those horizontal cloud clearance distances at the lower altitudes. After 1961, pilots could no longer have their cake and eat it too, at least when it came to flying VFR as high as they desired with limited rules. And that's because the positive control area had just been invented. Instead of applying positive control, in other words, an air traffic clearance, an IFR flight plan, instrument rated pilots, and so on, along just a few selected routes as had already been done, the FAA wanted to apply it over a larger area to protect fast-moving aircraft. An altitude of 18,000 feet, the top of the low-altitude airway system at the time, was discussed as the start of positive controlled airspace. The National Business Aircraft Association, NBAA, suggested that 24,000 feet would be a better choice for positive controlled airspace. The NBAA asked the FAA to raise the top of the low altitude airway system to 24,000 feet so that turboprops could have more VFR access to altitudes where they could obtain better operating efficiency and, in my opinion, where pilots could have a prettier view out the window. And the FAA considered then rejected this option. And this was primarily due to the issue of VOR frequency protection and not because they didn't want pilots to have a pretty view out their window. The problem was that the VORs on which the low altitude airway structure was built were spaced to prevent frequency overlap as long as the airplanes using these airways remained at an altitude of less than 18,000 feet. Creation of low altitude airways above 18,000 feet could have prevented accurate reception of the signal defining these low altitude routes. Even now, several low altitude airways have what they call MAAs or maximum authorized altitudes for the sole purpose of preventing signal interference from nearby VOR stations having the same or similar frequencies. Keep in mind that there are only so many frequencies allotted in the VHF spectrum for L-class VORs. Therefore, these VOR stations are spaced a minimum distance apart to prevent signal frequency overlap. And thus, if one were to try to receive a VOR at a higher altitude, let's say above 18,000 feet, then it's possible one might receive a VOR station from a distant VOR having the same frequency as a much closer one, thus signal interference. In 1961, the FAA took a look at the performance of the average general aviation airplane and decided that most small airplanes didn't use altitudes above 18,000 feet. And thus, this was the final altitude chosen for the beginning of positive controlled airspace and its accompanying jet route structure. So that's our brief tour of historical weather minimums and airspace development. It's interesting to see how the airspace structure developed based on the performance of the airplanes that used it. Not surprisingly, the rationale for selecting 18,000 feet as the base of positive controlled airspace now seems a little archaic given that we navigate primarily by area navigation or GPS. Raising the base of positive controlled airspace to 24,000 feet actually seems like a good idea given the performance of modern day general aviation airplanes, many which are equipped with turbochargers. On the other hand, every time I suggest it, the authorities never let me complete my sentence.